Here we're continuing to look at differentiable functions and the properties that they satisfy. And we're gonna look at something called the generalized mean value theorem and then L'Hopital's rule. So, but before we do that, I wanna recall something called Rolle's theorem, which we proved in the last video. And that says that if F, which goes from the closed interval A, B to R is continuous. So what I mean by that is it's continuous on this entire closed interval and it's differentiable on the open interval a to b satisfying this rule that f of a equals f of b so it's equal at the endpoints then there is a c in a b such that f prime of c is equal to zero so let's dig into what this is saying so this function is equal on the endpoints a and b which makes the average change over this interval zero but the fact that f prime of c is equal to zero for some c between a and b means that instantaneous change is equal to zero at some point. So again, this is Rolle's theorem. It can be generalized as something called the mean value theorem, which we did in the last video. So here we want to look at something called the generalized mean value theorem. That has to do with two functions. So we've got two functions, f and g and they go from the closed interval a b to r and they are continuous so in other words they're continuous on this entire closed interval and differentiable on the corresponding open interval and then what we get out of this is the existence of some c on the open interval where this equation is satisfied so notice we've got f of b minus f of a times g prime of c equals g of b minus g of a times f prime of c. So this isn't a super motivating equation, but if g prime of c is equal to zero, then we can rearrange this equation in a way so that it looks a little bit more motivating, and that's like this. So we've got f prime of c over g prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over g of b minus g of a. So this is in some ways like comparing the change of two functions on an interval. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and look at the proof of this. So the idea is we want to introduce a new function related to f and g that we can apply this theorem to that new function. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. So let's go ahead and set h of x, that's gonna be our new function, equal to f of b minus f of a times g of x. So notice that's just a constant multiple of g of x minus g of b minus g of a times f of x. So that's another constant multiple, in this case, of f of x. So notice h of x is a linear combination of g of x and f of x. So now we wanna show that all of the hypotheses of this are satisfied. So the continuity and the differentiability are automatically satisfied because we're just taking a linear combination of two functions that have this property already. Next, we wanna check that this function is equal on its endpoints. In other words, h of a equals h of b. So let's maybe go ahead and do that. So we'll take h of a, notice that that is equal to f of b minus f of a times g of a minus g of b minus g of a times f of a. So that's what we get if we plug in a into this. Okay, so now let's see what we get when we multiply all of this out and cancel some terms. So notice that we're going to have an f of a times a g of a term, and then we're gonna have another f of a times a g of a term here. And they have equal and opposite signs. So this one's attached to a minus sign, that one's attached to a plus sign. So that means this product we can cancel with this product. So let's see what that's gonna leave us with. So that's gonna leave us with f of b times g of a minus uh, g of b times f of a, like that. Okay, now let's check h of b and notice that we'll get the same thing. So this is gonna be f of b minus f of a times g of b minus g of b minus g of a times f of b. 
Now we can do a similar sort of simplification, but in this case, we're gonna simplify the f of b times g of b term. So here we've got a positive f of b times g of b, and here we have a negative f of b times g of b. And what do we get when we uh, cancel everything out? Well, we're gonna get exactly what we have above here. So I'm just gonna write that as the equality going through and then ending over here at h of b so that we have one string of equalities from h of a to h of b, allowing us to apply Rolle's theorem. So I'll go ahead and clean up this calculation and we'll do just that. So we've showed that this function h of x satisfies the hypotheses of Rolle's theorem. So that means we get the conclusions of Rolle's theorem. So in other words, there exists some c on the open interval a, b, such that h prime of c is equal to zero. But since we know the structure of h of x, we can easily find what h prime of c is. So notice that h prime of c will be equal to f of b minus f of a times g prime of c. That's using the constant multiple rule here. Again, keeping in mind that f of b minus f of a is a constant multiple. And then we have this as minus g of b minus g of a times f prime of c for the same reason. And like I said before, that's equal to zero because we've chosen that C in line with the conclusion of Rolle's theorem. But now let's see what we've got. We've got this big term minus this big term equals zero, but we can easily rearrange that into this equation right here. And then if G prime of C is not equal to zero, we can easily rearrange this equation into this equation right here. <clears throat> so in other words, this equation that we're left with, this f of b minus f of a g prime of c minus g of b minus g of a f prime of c equaling zero is equivalent to the conclusions to the conclusion of this generalized mean value theorem. So that finishes this proof. Okay, so now I'll go ahead and clean this up. I'm gonna move the statement of this generalized mean value theorem over here, and then we'll look at L'Hopital's rule. Now we're ready to use this generalized mean value theorem to prove the zero over zero case of L'Hopital's rule. So let's see the careful statement. So we wanna suppose that F and G are continuous on an interval containing A, and F of A equals G of A equals zero. G prime of X is not equal to zero for all X not equal to A, and that's a local condition. It really should say for all X not equal to A, like kind of in a neighborhood around A or something. Then we have the following implication. The limit as X goes to A of F prime of X over G prime of X equals L, that is going to imply that the limit as X goes to A of F of X over G of X equals L. So notice f of a and g of a are both equal to zero. So just straight up plugging in a into this would give us zero over zero. That's why it's this type of indeterminate form. In our setup, the existence and value of this limit is given to us, and that allows us to get the value of our goal limit over there. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and see how this proof goes. So we want to suppose that the limit as x goes to a of f prime of x over g prime of x equals l. So we are assuming that that is true, and our goal is to show that this is true. The limit is x goes to a of f of x over g of x equals l without the primes. So let's maybe go ahead and see how this is gonna go. So I'm just gonna start with this limit as x goes to a of f of x over g of x. Now I'm gonna subtract zero from the numerator and the denominator, but I'm gonna subtract a special form of zero. I'll subtract f of a from the numerator, g of a from the denominator. So that does not change this limit. So I'm gonna rewrite this as the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over g of x minus g of a. Good. Now I'm gonna turn this into a limit of sequences because we've got more algebraic machinery when it comes to dealing with limits of sequences versus limits of functions. So I'm gonna rewrite this as the limit as n approaches infinity of f of a plus one over n minus f of a over 
g of a plus 1 over n minus g of a. So I want to point out that this thing is continuous on an interval containing a. We don't actually know the size of that interval. Here we're assuming that size is at least 1 because notice if n equals 1, then we've got a plus 1 here. But you can tweak the numerator up here and down here so that it's continuous at a plus maybe epsilon over n if you want for all natural numbers n. Okay. So now the next thing that I want to do is apply the generalized mean value theorem to this setup. So now this is going to be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of f prime of a sub n over g prime of a sub n. And here this a sub n is on the open interval a to a plus 1 over n. So again, we got that equality and the location of this a sub n from the generalized mean value theorem. Now what I want to notice really quick, and this is maybe uh, not too hard to show, and that is that a sub n converges to a as n approaches infinity. And that's because we're pinning this a sub n in a smaller and smaller and smaller interval here. But what that means is that we can exchange this limit back for a functional limit instead of a sequential limit. So this is going to be equal to the limit as x goes to a of f prime of x over g prime of x, which is equal to l. So notice we started with our goal limit and ended with the value that we wanted to end with. And so that finishes this proof.